Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to the Facebook Live on our uh, group page, Exploring the Infinite Potential in Presence. It is March the 10th. Uh, welcome. Today, I'm joined by our panel. Um, we have April, who is a uh, psychic, and she's a spiritual teacher as well. Welcome, April. Uh, then we have Kelly, our Qigong teacher. Good evening, Kelly. Uh, we have Caesar, who uh, has practiced channeling and is a spiritual teacher. Good evening, Caesar. And Travis, our musician, our, I think even Caesar is a musician in his own way. And uh, so our other musician, uh, Travis, is back with us. The one person we are missing today is Louise. She had some um, personal issues, so she's not with us. Hopefully, she's online with us uh, today. And then, of course, our incredible Eileen. And Eileen has had a challenging week. In spite of that, I am in, I am so deeply, deeply grateful, Eileen, that you're here. Because I was like, how am I going to manage if Eileen does not show up? How am I going to manage the comments and uh, all the being able to speak as well? I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. So um, if all of you remember, when we ended the last session, we ended it with a question from Summer. And I kind of think that that question needs to be explored a little bit more because I kind of like very quickly did an answer and we were running out of time. Uh, it was very late. And I know April and Caesar and uh, Kelly may have more to say. So, uh, she asked, does everybody reach enlightenment before death? Um, the lucky ones a long time before. She asked me this question through Messenger, but she again had posted um, the same question. So does everybody reach enlightenment before death? The lucky ones a long time before. And does sudden death count? And my answer to her was yes when the spirit leaves uh, in the Eckhart in a new earth um, gives the example of a deer or a zebra the spirit leaving the zebra the lion kills the zebra and the spirit leaving the zebra and at that point the one consciousness that was the zebra uh, is getting liberated from its form right so um, this goes back to I'll, I'll go through the, does everybody reach enlightenment before death? Or maybe it's more like uh, enlightenment right as they are passing away. I took that question to be um, more as, uh, do they reach enlightenment right as they're passing away? So this also goes back to the whole, uh, we've had con conversations about soul and soul contracts, right, April? So, uh, this is the part that I was explaining that uh, it is not that let's just start with this question that do we reach enlightenment and then we'll go into this why, why were we born why did that soul actually exit the body right exit that physical form so April it's all yours thank you yeah, uh, we did touch on this last week, and then um, I did get sort of a sense from it that it's kind of asking like the whole, you know, the big question is why. I think all of us are, uh, even if we don't, even if you're not on a spiritual journey, I think at some point you do ask that question of why, what is this all for? Um, I can, and it makes me think of uh, people like just humans in general, as we have evolved, um, to me, this again is proof of how much we are evolving, even though there is so much uh, chaos going on in the world right now. Um, my stepdad is a very uh, 
simple kind of person. You get up, you go to work, uh, you come home, you have dinner, you watch some TV, you go to bed, you sign up for the union, you pay your bills, very just basic. What is the purpose of life for him? It's to get a job and a car and a retirement, right? So I think all of us have that question. I think even he has, you know, has asked that question at some point. Those of us that um, are on the spiritual journey, the question becomes a little deeper and we want to know not just, you know, what's the purpose of life beyond my material things? What is it spiritually? What is it for my soul? What is the meaning behind all of it? But I do want to say that I don't think everybody reaches enlightenment before death. Not everybody does that. Now, because of the, our belief systems that we have, um, if you're in a, you know, if you're in uh, like my stepdad's belief system, he doesn't believe there's anything before death, after death, beyond death, nothing. So he would just know that he's dying and he's dying. That's it. He would not reach enlightenment before death. Um, but people like him and many others before death, because the soul, the spirit is actually separating from the body, will have those experiences where they're in hospice or they're in their bedroom or the hospital and they're looking at you and they're saying, oh, there's grandma over there and their grandma died 20 years ago. What are you talking about? So their soul does have an evolution. They're just not aware of it. But I agree with you as far as once we do pass, everybody goes to the other side. Everybody gets enlightened. Everybody gets healed. There's this, if you listen to the NDEs, what they describe is there's like this kind of chamber, the space that you go to and they say it's black. And for us, black is normally a scary color, right? We're scared, but they describe it as being, having so much love and healing. So I think it's what Catholics think of as purgatory. It's that space, but that it's that space where you get healed from everything you've been through in this lifetime before you go to the uh, to the light. Now, some people go straight to the light. Um, but to answer the question, I don't think everybody does. And I think that's based off of your belief systems that you have here. But once you do pass, yes, absolutely. Everybody gets re-enlightened. So we'll just start with that part. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. And I took the question to be something of that sort that she actually means, even though she's saying before death, she actually means like as the spirit is leaving the body, do they get it enlightened? And like you say, the couple of near death experiences that I've uh, listened to and experienced and Gracie and I actually took uh, um, the course with Dr. Eben Alexander, who's a neuroscientist, right? And he, both of them say, Anita Murjani and uh, uh, Dr. Eben Alexander say that uh, they just return to like this unconditional love. Like there's so much divine love that they experience, right? As the, uh, as the spirit is leaving the body. The other thing that I want to explore after I go through the uh, through the panel is the review, the life review piece of the soul spirit le leaving the body and uh, going through a life review. Thank you, April. Uh, Travis, did you want to speak to? Thank you. Sure. Um, well, I think this is a, a pretty um, lofty um, uh, ambitious kind of question to ask. So I, I would imagine it would uh, require you know, tremendous wisdom on someone's part to really be able to answer it as best it can be. Um, so, you know, I, I know for myself when I hear it, you know, I, I don't want to throw around 
my suppositions or what I think might be the case. I definitely have ideas of what I think might be the case, but I find myself thrown into a space where I go, what do I know with absolute certainty? What can I really say with, with any real authority, if anything, um, to this question? Um, and is it, you know, um, is, or, and, and maybe is it, is it a question that's gonna lead us to an even more appropriate question? Um, and not that it's a bad question or a wrong question to ask, but it could be one that leads us to one that helps bring our attention more in the way and direction that would best serve us. So, um, so, so how I will spontaneously attempt to answer this question um, is, is that what's important is, is where our attention is, is going right now. Um, and it, I, I, I have a funny, uh, a, a, a saying I've made up that I think is cute and probably uh, deeper than I want to act like it is, but, but I kind of jokingly say, you're closer to enlightenment now than you will be in the future. And that's always true. And so the, 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 the question really is, is, is how close to enlightenment am I right now? Because when we talk about death, oftentimes what we're doing is we're creating time and we're creating future and we're creating D distance between the uttermost and, 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 and where we are within ourselves right now. So, um, and I think that the more that we can be, um, the more that we can fixate our attention on uh, the very heart of life right now, um, the more likely <laughs> we will be to experience any relative degree of enlightenment right now, um, the, the, the greater uh, possibility for us to um, transcend birth and death now, and the greater possi the possibility for us to transcend birth and death in that moment of physical death, where, which, it, which is almost like a culmination of our entire life. I think that I, 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 this, I, I don't know that I feel like I can say this th from some place of authority of experience, but I feel so confident enough about it to say it, that in the moment that we die, um, whatever we've been focusing our attention on throughout the whole duration of our entire lives as this incarnation that we happen to be right now, it, it's almost like the whole thing just comes to a, to a head or it, it, it's like a concentrated um, culmination of, of our attention and how we've spent it. And so if we've directed our attention in a good way, toward, to, to, toward in, in, into our heart of hearts, right? Which is the heart of life, is not different from life or the heart of life. Um, the, the more that we're able to do that, um, the more likely it is that, that we, that we'll become free from this uh, unconscious assumption and gross misapprehension of who we think we are, which is limited in some fashion or other, which I believe very well may be why we continually experience ourselves as that which belongs to time and that which is limited because we have this gross misapprehension, this unconscious assumption that who we are is limited and so we're born and so we die. That's what, that's time. That's the dimension of time that we think we're limited. 
And if you, and that's another goofy saying I make up for myself as I say, if you think so, you're probably right. And that's just my funny way of saying, uh, kind of pointing to the degree of power that we have with our suggestion to ourselves and to others. Um, and so, um, so, but to, to, so just to go back and answer the question in a simpler way, um, no, not everybody becomes enlightened before they die. Not everybody becomes enlightened when they die. Um, so long as we think we're limited, we'll continue to repeatedly experience ourselves as limited. The reason we have to do it over and over again is because if we, uh, uh, that's, that's the only way that we can experience the limitation is for it to begin and end and then begin and then end, begin and end, and begin and end, and begin and end forever and ever and ever until we finally realize the absolute unwavering truth of who we are, which isn't limited in any way. And that's what enlightenment is. It's the realization of the truth of who we are that is not different from and doesn't have any existence of its own apart from that which is unlimited in every way. There is only that. And so now is the best moment to get to know that which is unlimited in every way, ourselves, our deepest selves, our highest selves. So, thanks. Thank you, Travis. And my uh, response to agreeing with uh, April and uh, knowing the truth of when Dr. Eben Alexander or Anita Murjani talk about their near-death experience is I can experience that death when I go into stillness, right? When we talk about the infinity, the inf infinite death, that we can go inwards, make that journey inwards, and that inward journey it's eternal, like you can keep going and going and going and going, and there is no end to how deep you can go. And that experience where I'm no longer this body, no longer this mind, but this pure energy, right? It's just vibrational energy. When I'm in that experience, I can know that when my body drops, right? all that will be left is that experience of that energy. So thank you. Thank you for that, Travis. That's, that's all that we are is that infinity and we return to infinity, right? The unmanifested non-physical energy. So thank you. Uh, Kelly, did you wanna uh, weigh in into what April said? Thank you. This is an excellent and very wonderfully deep topic. Um, short answer is yes and no. <laughs> um, the, the use of the word enlightenment is, is one that we've all gotten accustomed to without sort of looking a little bit deeper at the mechanisms. Um, Everyone has within them that spark of creation. So everyone already carries their own enlightenment with them, what, whether or not they are conscious of it or not. When we pass on, when our energy chooses to end its attachment to this 3D reality illusion, and we step across that threshold, we reintegrate and reemerge with that spark of creation and become what the human mind likes to refer to as enlightened. There are lots of different kinds of enlightenment. In, in Zen Buddhism, there is Rinzai and Soto schools where you have the sudden enlightenment of the Rinzai school and you have the Soto style of enlightenment of the gradual incremental growth into enlightenment. And 
personally, uh, from my uh, near death experiences, I remember quite vividly how the threshold is actually a lot more thin than people want to see it as. We're so stuck on the whole concrete, solid 3D reality that we forget how to feel inside ourselves. When we forget how to be present, we get caught up in the external information as if the external information outside of our hearts and outside of our alignment with spirit is who we actually are and that that is what determines enlightenment when that is not what determines enlightenment whatsoever. Everyone carries their Buddha nature with them. Everyone carries their enlightenment already predestined inside of them. It just depends on what choices they make and whether or not they choose to actively participate in their journey and learn how to be present and learn how to align themselves with their heart and connect with their heart and connect with that spark of creation inside us. And so, yeah, like as April said, it's like as soon as anyone crosses over, they wake up, <laughs> they wake back up to their enlightenment. And that's the whole point of human existence is that choice. Although in a lot of ways, when you look at the concept and the perspective of soul contracts, you sort of realize that the concept of choice actually has two sides to it. You have the, the mental projection of the idea of what choice is, and then you have the soul level active participation and obligations of participation and those influences on our journey through life. So the short answer is yes and no. <laughs> The short answer is that if I am hearing Smar, Smar uh, correctly, uh, the assumption is that um, enlightenment only happens either before or after death. And that's also a, a dualistic reality. And enlightenment, I mean, creation does not know those uh, walls, those barriers, those concepts of duality creation, the, the eternal is always present in all of us all the time. And it's up to us to just to to make that choice whether or not we want to listen or not. Two cents. Thank you, Kelly. Um your uh, second way of uh, enlightenment, and this is something that Eckhart um, himself said, that most humans, they don't have this awakening, like the fireworks kind of moment that he had. Uh, what did you say, the Soto? The Soto way of awakening, which is gradual. Soto in, in Rinzai. Soto. R-I-N-Z-A-I. Yep. Thank you. So it's very gradual and it kind of brought me the image of um, when Jack Cornfield and Eckhart were uh, in conversation with each other. Jack Cornfield brings this example of uh, somewhere in Thailand, they covered a golden Buddha statue with clay. And then one monk, one day he found like one little uh, chink in the clay and it was sparkling. And then he took a chisel and started chiseling at the clay. And soon enough, the golden Buddha statue, like the, and the glow of the golden Buddha was like, that's how we are. That's how our enlightenment is. The first moment is a moment of grace, but then once grace enters, then we have to keep uh, chiseling away at that clay to let the gold come through. So thank you. Caesar, did you want to talk about uh, enlightenment before death or after? Um, sure. I think um, to start with, we are born out of enlightenment as pure consciousness. And I, I believe the whole term enlightenment to me is more of a realization of the self and this Travis and everybody touched on the higher self 
um, all that you are and as, as vibrational beings, first and foremost, and an extension of source energy, we are always that, the limitless, as Travis put it. And that just in a way becomes veiled or hazed through our experience in the manifested form, in the world of form. And upon returning to that, um, I think it would be safe to say, and again, I don't know the absolute in this, um, but I would say for most people, they have that opportunity um, to gain enlightenment in, in most, you know, near death or at the time of death, other than sudden death, when, when life is stripped quickly. Um, I don't know if that opportunity approaches or not to have that because I don't think, I mean, enlightenment on the other side is just going back to pure consciousness. I think enlightenment to me again means a realization while we are in the in the world of form. Um, but once we uh, once we croak per se, um, I think we return to all that we are as pure consciousness. Um, as we were when we were born into this um, world of form. But I believe everybody um, has that opportunity granted. It's not a sudden and quick thing, um, as April was saying. Um, yeah, and typically um, when, when you're trying to wake somebody up, you would like to do it slowly. You know, maybe a little tap and then maybe a little shake. It's probably never a good idea to throw a bucket of cold water on somebody you know, and shock them. Uh, most people, I believe, that I've had the opportunity to talk to over the years have started a journey through through deep suffering. Um, you know, much pain and much suffering in their lives that caused them a reasoning to ask, what is this life for? Why are we here? What is this all about? What happens when we die? Am I going to see my loved ones? And, uh, and I believe it is human nature to ask these questions. It's just a matter of at what stage on your timeline currently do you actually proceed with that and, and gain such vision of clarity of as to what this is and even then do you really know for sure but if you have an understanding that we are consciousness um an extension of source energy i mean the same energy that creates worlds we are a very part of that and having said that, um, there's not a whole lot of, I want to say, reason to put much thought behind that because that in itself is enough for me to just, um, I'm good with that. I'll roll with that. <laughs> um, and there are still many questions, you know, that one might have along the way as to strengthen their beliefs. Um, but beliefs are a hard thing to hang on to in, in the road of enlightenment for the simple fact that once you have a belief, you kind of limit yourself as to, you know, what is true and what is not because a belief becomes your truth. It's just the repeated thought. Yes. And that repeated thought becomes your truth. And once another opportunity for knowledge or wisdom comes knocking at the door, well, based on your beliefs, um, determines whether or not you're going to be open to another opinion or, you know, what is truth. That's why truth resonates um, as a frequency. Some people are very capable of picking up on that resonation um, through that frequency and others are, are getting there. I suppose, I, I think like Tolly said 15, uh, 17 years ago when he wrote the book that, you know, he feels the shift is happening now and it, it has to happen now. And you can see by today's world that we're living in that it's, um, it's pretty vital that this shift happens now. Um, let's take a look at what's happening in the world today. It's time for everybody to wake up. And, uh, and I believe um, that soon we'll all be on a, on a fifth dimensional plane. So does people, do people um, before or after death? Sometimes yes, sometimes maybe no. Um, final answer, I don't know. Thank you, Caesar. Sure.
And I would say um, enlightenment was, what is the definition of enlightenment is what you said is being aware of being aware, self-aware, self-awareness, right? So I just wanted to clarify that. That's, and we are already there as Travis said, Kelly said, we are already awareness. It's just being self-aware of that awareness. Thank you, Caesar. Um, Arlene, did you want to say something about Summer's question? Thank you. I don't think I'm going to add anything. I um, was going to say some of the things that Travis had said. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Arlene. So Nancy has joined us here live and she had a question. And after that, Lakshmi has already posted or Eileen has posted a question from Lakshmi. Mm -hmm. uh, so go ahead, Nancy. Read yeah, the hi. Can, Thank you. Okay. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I, this, uh, I, I don't, this is kind of, I'll, I'll keep it quick. <laughs> I'm off to a great start and I'm sorry. It's a little, complicated i don't know how to say it and i don't even know if this is the right forum but um i think that as you know and i brought it up here that i have wrestled for the last uh, six weeks or so on uh, changing uh, my living situation but one of the things that i'm really struggling like all for the past couple of days i've just been wanting to cry all the time like that's my that is how i feel and so even sitting outside the library today you know i just i'm just i i can't i don't know what's going on with me and i'm thinking am i in my ego is this an ego thing and that's why i'm feeling the way i'm feeling or is it because like i have all these action steps lined up but i'm too afraid to take these action steps or i'm nervous about taking them you know all this stuff blah 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 and so I'm stuck, but like, um, so I guess my, I think that my question, I'm not quite sure about it because on the, on, for me, I'm always thinking, okay, I need to be in presence. That was said last week, you know, be in presence where you are. So all week I'm going, okay, I have to be in presence where I am. You know, I either find it here, I don't find it anywhere, you know, so I'm very cognizant of that, but at the same time, I'm aware of, a distressed mental state and I'm thinking okay like is that where do I find like like I give up I, I don't know what to do so then I think okay well maybe this other people would say okay I'm, I'm this isn't working I gotta go and me I'm going oh I, I better find presence here you know if I don't find it here I can't find it anywhere or you know, is this ego? Like, I think that's my biggest fear is I'm stuck in my ego. And so I'm not happy. So that's, I, I don't know if you see the question or, or understanding it, what I'm trying to put forward, that any feedback would be great. Thanks. So your biggest problem is not your ego. Your biggest problem is not that you're not finding presence. Your biggest problem is that you're judging yourself. You're judging yourself. Am I in ego? Am I in presence? Am I in space? Am I in relaxation? Am I, should I move? Should I, it's all this judgment, which is ego essentially, but coming out of ego and creating presence, creating presence comes from breathing, space, taking that moment, no judgment, no, what am I doing? No, do I have it? It's that quiet space. So can you take that quiet space with me? Just, just let it go and just take that space. We're not thinking. We're not answering. We're just taking a space. That's presence. That's what can go with you. Did you have more on her question, April? I have, I mean, I can answer more, but that was the initial thing that came to me. So I was going to let the other members add on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, April. 
Eileen, did you yeah. want to say something? Um, I was just going to add on to what um, April said. It makes me think of almost um, when I feel like I've, you're striving too much, like you're striving to make the tri right choice. You're striving to complete something. You're all this like um, expectations for yourself and being able to drop all that. And the one thing that I thought of while April was speaking is how um, a lot of times I will like forget what I'm doing. You know, I'll be in the middle of something and suddenly I'm like, wait, what was I just doing? And you sit there and you grasp and you grasp and you grasp and you're like, it'll come to me. I just got it. And then I remember, no, just let it go. And then when you truly just let it go, it doesn't matter that I forgot. I'm not going to judge myself for forgetting. I'm not going to grasp at or strive to remember. And as soon as I let it go, I remember. Um, and so that's something that kind of comes to mind. It doesn't necessarily exactly relate to the situation, but it's like that need to just let it go, just be in stillness and know that the correct choice and what's meant to be will be like it will happen. Thank you so much, Ali. Uh, the biggest example I can give of that is uh, when talking to Louise the past few days, she presented me with situation A, life situation A, right? And within a few hours, she's presented, oh, but now it's life situation B. I said, what is your present moment? Your present moment now is life situation B. That is what is. You have to surrender to life situation B. A few, uh, maybe by today, yeah, last night, she had life situation C. I said, now your present moment is life situation C. So you have to make choices over and over again. It's like uh, each present moment, you, you make a choice. Each present moment, you make a choice. And it always is that we are at peace. The choice is peaceful. There's kindness, compassion, gratitude, and humility flowing in that moment. And that's it. It may be that you're abandoning something, right? Like. Uh, like, uh, I'll give you an example, Nancy. I made the choice not to go to my mom's uh, funeral because it could not have, it was physically impossible for me to see her body before she was cremated. Because in India, they cremate the body within four hours. I'm in the US, there's no way I'm going to get there in four hours, right? The travel itself is 24 hours. So I made the choice not to go. Life situation presented. This is my present moment. Can I make it to her cremation? No. Then there is no point in me making that decision. At peace. So many people, if I did not have uh, Eckhart's teachings, so many human beings would be mortified that they did not go to their mom's funeral. Mother, very close, right? and they did not go and never see, never been there, right? Not even like the 10th ceremony, a 10th day ceremony or 13th day ceremony or whatever ceremony, right? I never went to India after her passing away and I'm at peace with them. That's how much presence matters. That's how it feels like this is the right decision. Presence is the key. So Caesar is nodding. You want to say something more, Caesar? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you hit it right on the head. And having said that, Nancy, um, you know, April touched on it for sure um, about the judgmental part of yourself, judging yourself and questioning whether you're making the right moves or not. I would simply su to suggest, as Poonam said, surrender to the isness, wherever it is, whatever it is you're doing. You are there for a reason. Embrace it. Get excited about it. Figure out why life has led you where you are at instead of being worried about where you're going or whether or not this is the right decision. Um, 
And once you can get excited about this or, or just have gratitude for whatever it is, there's something there within your presence always. And I promise you, there is something within the moment, every single moment that you can get excited about and be grateful for, um, whether it's a simple breath or the thought of some great things coming your way. Um, things have always worked out for you. If you can um, give us a, maybe a yes or no on the screen or something is, did, does everything always seem to be working out for you? I mean, at some stage of the game, it always seems to work out, yes. Um, so I would say embrace whatever it is about your situation, whether you deem it good or bad. And remember, um, it's not good or bad. So there is no right or there is no wrong. It is simply neutral. And it is our minds, our creative thinking, that determines or suggests to us whether that's good and that's bad or this is right and that's wrong when neither is so. It just is what it is. Everything is simply is what it is. Nothing more, nothing less. There is a little thing you can play with called choice. And choice is, again, a superpower, and you can always change the definition of a situation. If you're going to judge a situation as being good or bad, tell yourself it's good, and then change the, defini change the definition of your situation and, and give it a meaning that would suggest um, that it's for the betterment of your well-being. Um, like maybe, and, and understand this, you know, it, ego, of course it's ego. It, to, to the ego, change is very, very, very scary. In fact, I think that's the most scariest thing to the ego. So step outside the box, Nancy. Embrace the isness of it. Surrender to it. Let go. Um, just seriously embrace the isness of wherever it is that you are and whatever it is you are going through. Promise you'll get through it. Um, and find something, something, anything just to be grateful for. And if you can continue this little run every morning um, and, and just milk that feeling of, of gratitude, you know, as much as you possibly can throughout the day and find something that is exciting. Do whatever it is that is most exciting available to you in any moment. And that will lead you to the next moment and the next and the next and the next. That's just creating, you know, momentum for yourself, following the energy of life that leads the way for all of us. Um, when you are scared and worried, and, and that's just a low vibrational frequency that you're obtaining and in worry and doubt. Um, and that's what life will continue to offer you more of. It's more stuff to be worried about, more stuff to doubt. So you have the ability to change the direction or the, um, the perception of your own reality. So instead of having the worry and the fear again for the last time, I've said this a few times already, just embrace it and be excited about it and, and know that you're there for a reason. Um, you have work to do there. And that's something to be excited about. And then that again will lead you to something better. Life is never gonna lead you down um, a rusty road of uh, nails and broken glass, honey. You know, we do that. We stray, and it is through our uh, stinking thinking that takes us down that um, that road. So embrace the isness, surrender to the isness of it, and um, and things will work out fine. And, and trust and believe the journey. Stinking thinking. Um, what do you think of? Um, so she said something about crying and crying and crying. Um, was there an expectation? Uh, Nancy, that when wherever you are right now, that things would be a certain way, and they didn't go the way that you wanted them to be, right? Okay, she says yes. So that's where the crying is coming from, and you recognize that the pain gap. This is what Eckhart says in uh, chapter ten of the power of now, and we've talked about it in group meditation quite a few times, right? I mean, the what reality is and our expectation, the gap between reality and our expectation, this is the pain gap. That's the crime. Recognize that, hey, I had expectations which were just thought formations. I need to let it go. 
reality is showing me something different, I accept what um, Caesar is saying, right? Acceptance of reality, this is what is. I surrender to it. I'm going to be grateful that I had this experience. I saw my mom. I, I did everything that I needed to do with my mom, right? Her passing away and I'm done. My job here is done. I'm gonna move back, okay? Be at peace. I want, I want to just add on what you said, because okay. once you fully do that and you accept, like Poonam was just saying, that's a perfect example. Once she made the decision that she was not going to go visit her mother, and like she said, many people would just be devastated and they would they would carry that their whole life saying, I wish I could have just seen my mother, my biggest regret. I knew I should have went there and I didn't. I now I got to live with that. Once she made the conscious decision fully as if she had chose that that was the situation, even though it didn't allow her to, maybe it did allow her to, and she still made that decision. She did it fully and wholeheartedly. And once she accepted that 100%, that thought of that doubt that, gee, I wish I could have did that, or maybe I should have went and seen her, will never affect her again because she made that full conscience decision purely 100% in acceptance and surrender. So I just wanted to add that. That's what surrender looks like, is not a single thought of guilt not a single, and it's been four years, not a single thought of guilt. Did I cry? Yes, I did my dis distress and sadness and everything, all done. Clean, cleanse myself and next moment is next moment, right? Travis, you have more insights on uh, what uh, Nancy is saying and I'll read some of her. Sure. Um... Well, thanks for, for uh, sharing, Nancy, and uh, um, it, it's a vulnerable and brave thing to, uh, to put all that out there, so I appreciate it. And um, I feel like one thing I want to say, just to add to um, everybody's love, you, you know, that I feel in response, which is so sweet to be a part of, um, is, is that... Um, these things can be really subtle sometimes. There, there, there are, there's uh, a, a, a quality or a, a, a refined degree of discernment necessary um, so that we don't, um, it, for example, um, it, could, it could be easy to even have it go under the radar that, that maybe, you know, um, that, that you shouldn't feel sad, that you shouldn't be feeling pain right now, that you shouldn't be feeling all this indecision um, because that's just, you know, that's just coming from judging yourself. It's coming from all these things it's coming from. And, and so I, I wanna add to what everybody's been saying and say that it's okay to be in indecision. It's okay to be feeling pain. It's okay to be, I, th I think it, we have to give ourselves the space and validate what we're going through. And it can be a subtle thing where, where sometimes we don't always feel it right. That it's because, because we, we, some part of us feels like we know that's not the wisest place to be. So then we can beat ourselves up for it. Or, and again, that is, it's it there, there are layers to it <laughs> and so it it does and and so i i very much agree with april about the breathing is is a is a real uh powerful tool to um kind of tease out that 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 judgment and kind of bring us ourselves into that place where we can like how Eckhart Tolle says can i be the space for that Right. If I'm feeling pain, can I? Can I? Well, can I be the space for that? Can I just hold the space for that right now and let it be there? Um, and then it's it, it's a, a curious and wondrous thing that when we allow whatever it is that we didn't want so much to be there, um, it 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 almost works itself out on its own. And so, so I wanted to add that, and then also. Um, that um, 
you know, in a way, I, I and this is this is just an attitude that I've co-opted in my life, and so this may serve you, um, or it may not. But is is that it, there's not a real wrong choice to make. The 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 criterion for me is to pay attention, and so just do whatever I feel like doing, but just watch. Just make sure to watch, and see how I'm. Uh, how I am inwardly and see how the choices I make make me feel. And so, and to have kind of a scientific approach to living and, and a playful approach so I can try things out and I can experiment and I can make choices and go here or go there or do this or do that and, and, um, and, and, and not feel like there's one right decision or one wrong decision but just, to, but just to watch. And I think that that um, is just, to, it's, that, that's my way of piggybacking on what, uh, on what everyone else has said, because just watching is just an inverted way of saying, don't judge. Because <laughs> if we're just watching, we're not in a place of judgment, we're just observing, we're just witnessing. It's prior to judgment. And so, 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 so it is to be in that space of, that's uh, just a, a different way of putting it, but it's to say to just, just watch, just watch and see. And so that's, that's one thing I would add. Um, and, and then a, another thing that came up for me is that th we can derive tremendous satisfaction from different choices and things that we do and from different situations. And they can be very helpful but ultimately, um, all of the satisfaction that we derive from external things, from situations, it, 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 it's going to have the same nature as those situations. So situations, by definition, they weren't there. They get situated, and they are there for a while. And then they eventually, all the pieces go in different directions, and it's not a situation anymore. It's it used to be a situation. So the, 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 the kind of satisfaction that we can derive from situations is fleeting, just like situations. And so, um, the, so if we want a satisfaction, a piece um, that, that lasts, that doesn't diminish in time, we can't find it from the, the world which is, a, which is a situation. <laughs> so, so um, we, we have to be able to find that which water can't wet and fire can't burn and, and time can't, nothing can be added to it or taken away from it. It's absolutely imperative that we find that if we want um, something that we can really rely on um, it's, it's an, it's, it's observable that everything that, that comes and goes in time is utterly unreliable. It's or <laughs> ultimately unreliable. So you might be able to rely on it for a lifetime. Um, but, but that time will come to pass too. So, so just to put a, an emphasis on, on that mysterious, uh, un, unnameable, I don't know how to put words to that um, is, is to, to me is the, is the main key um, in any situation. So. Beautiful, Travis. So what Eckhart says is life isn't as uh, serious as the mind makes it, right? That's what you're saying, just enjoy it. Like whatever decision you make, just move. It will, it will, it will come to pass, yes. <laughs> it, it, it will come to pass. If you create a challenge, the challenge will disappear, dissolve. And if it's not a challenge, if it's the right decision. Um, I think last week, uh, Nancy was asking a question and Lakshmi posted that be in the state of the unknown, right? I don't know if you remember, I think you had posted it here on Zoom, that be in the unknown. It doesn't matter. 
none of us know what is going to be more than this moment. I'm sure I'm talking to this panel and everyone out there in this moment. Other than that, I don't know what's going to happen in the next moment. And I don't need to know what's going to happen in the next moment or two days from now or a month from now or two months from now or when I go there, what's going to happen. I don't need to know. I need to know this moment. And I know it very well because I'm enjoying this interaction. I'm in the joy of this interaction in this moment. And that's all that is needed. And Nancy, you jo enjoy this interaction in this moment. In a new art, Eckhart says, uh, somebody says, uh, what should I do? And uh, where should I be? And Eckhart in a new art says, what are you doing now? You're listening to me right now. So listen to me, right? So maybe this person was in a retreat and asking him that, or one-on-one -on -one asking Eckhart this question. So this is on chapter seven, the inner purpose and outer purpose. And this person asks, uh, what, what am I supposed to do? And Eckhart says, where are you now? You're listening to me right now. So listen, listen to me. That's all that is your purpose. So one conscious breath to another conscious breath. You, if you have to sh brush your teeth, brush your teeth. If you have to go shower, go shower. If you, if you have to get ready, pack your clothes, pack your clothes. Then go get into whatever vehicle that, that's going to take you to the other place, get into the vehicle. One moment, one moment, one moment, one moment, nothing more. And life will unfold by itself. The right people, I mean, they've given, I mean, since we are alive, right? You get in an airplane, yeah? Get, get on a flight, uh, do your check-in, enjoy your interaction with the TSA agent or the security person that's gonna check your ID, and then walk in, enjoy your interaction with the gate agent, enjoy your interaction with the flight attendant, and so on and so forth. I hope it makes sense. Exactly what I told Louise. Now this is your present moment. Now this, what did uh, April one day say? It's now, and that now went away. Now, now this now went away. Now it's this now, right? That's it. It's this now, and razor is the edge of this now. Peace, peace to peace to peace to peace. Kelly, thank you, Travis. Go ahead, Kelly. <clears throat> so um, what Nancy is actually experiencing here is her ego and her shadow working against her to keep her from seeing how stuck she is in the disappointment. Her ego is trying to keep her stuck in the disappointment and not see how her mind and her patterns are working against her and dredging up, bringing up all this disappointment and causing her to want to just stay stuck crying be be crying now i would caution the uh over focus on trying to find the now when you are dealing with your emotional reptilian and shadow defense mechanisms you want to be afraid and do it anyhow be embracing of the fear embracing of the feeling embracing of the experience but take action. You said you have a list of things that you need to do. So pick one, start, take that first step. Let yourself feel all the disappointment and all the fear and all the fear that is present there because that is part of your experience. Do not dismiss what you're feeling. That is part of your present moment. Is the fear, is the disappointment, is the everything that you're feeling understand that your ego is going to try and keep you stuck in feeling all that fear and disappointment and keep you from stepping back into observation and actually taking action and doing what you need to do. So yes, what you said earlier about how, see, what you, what you, what you shared out of the, 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 
Yeah, maybe the thinking was the situation would f fulfill the need. <sighs> Examine the need. The practical issue of fulfilling something through an external event, through an attachment to an external something is also part of the illusion and also part of how the ego works against you and keeps you from being present. So looking at the defeat that you feel because your need was not fulfilled or you know you're living in quote unquote paradise what you are experiencing is the true duality of reality where you can live in paradise but be in hell at the same time because you are not present you are not allowing yourself to see what you have done to yourself and you have to understand too that seeing what you have done to yourself and feeling that disappointment is part of your spiritual evolution. You have given yourself this learning experience to look beyond this pattern that you are stuck in of needing to have an experience to fulfill a need outwardly instead of going inside and looking at the pattern and disassembling the pattern, deconstructing the pattern and being present with yourself. Again, when, when I have always found myself in situations where I don't know what to do and, you know, when I, when I got divorced and I had a whole Mack truck load convoy of grief <laughs> rolling over me every day, you know, it was a practical thing. This is literally one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other, the practical things that brought me back to myself. So sometimes making lists and having things to do, even, even a daily list, daily reminders. You know, I, I, I really appreciate what everyone has said because yes, like being in the present moment is super, super important, but it's also super, super important to understand that when you are stuck in a feeling or the feeling of disappointment or grief to Understand that that is not who you are. You are, the, you are the present. You are the alignment with yourself, with the eternal. And any feeling that you are feeling is your information as to how your mind works and why it works the way that it does according to your egoic patterns. So all of this is coming up. Yes, all this is coming up because you had expectations. Exactly. You had expectations, you had assumptions, you were projecting it outward onto the entire situation as to how it should be, would be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then it wasn't. And you feel defeated. That's a normal experience. Do not beat yourself up over that. That is just life. That is a normal experience. This is about learning your own language for being able to feel what really is in your heart. And this learning experience is all about that. Feeling such deep grief and disappointment, such deep grief over the disappointment is perfectly normal and perfectly all right. Do not get stuck in it. Understand that if you are feeling stuck in that emotional content, it is because your ego is working against you to keep you stuck in that limited belief of yourself that you cannot let go, that you cannot fulfill your own needs. What was the other part? The expectation that I would see my sister, that would be friends, that would be forever, blah, blah, blah. Right. These are feelings and responses to thinking, but not essence. The attachment to, um, again, family. This is also about, you know, you're, you're bringing up your sister. You're bringing up, you know, this concept of needing uh, your, you know, your, your sister or your family and stuff like that, you know? Um this is about attachment. This is about seeing deeper. You're giving yourself a thorough learning experience. Change the way you talk to yourself about what's going on. You are giving yourself a thorough learning experience. When I did that to myself, <laughs> when I finally did that to myself, when I was getting divorced, it, it monumental mountain ranges of change happened because I stopped my mind from telling myself, oh, you know, this is bad, that's awful, everything's miserable, blah, 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 blah. And I go, no, I am learning something truly profound and it is making me stronger. Yes, as if we, as if the time and the linear progression of life is what validates your value. 
That is not what validates your value. What validates your value is how you choose to believe in yourself, what you believe about yourself, and how much space you give yourself to be present and to listen to your heart and to understand that everything in the external world is a learning experience. Everything in the external world is there to reflect back at you what you need to learn about yourself, especially deep feelings of grief and disappointment. Those are all <laughs> wonderful learning experiences, even if it absolutely sucks at the time. Going through it is what matters because that is the learning experience that you're giving yourself. You have chosen to be where you are. Yeah, it's awful. You know what? And that's normal. That's, you know, um, yay, yay you for, for providing yourself and creating an awful experience to go deeper and to actually show yourself how much stronger you really are. Because that's what this is all about. It's not about the house. It's not about your sister. It's not about the friends. It's about the choices you are making to listen to yourself and to give you back your own strength of alignment and to heal that separation with your heart and to heal that separation from your belief in yourself. So yeah, it's awful. It's ugly. It's messy. It's, it's all of those things. But a grain of sand turns into a pearl and an oyster, right? A lump of coal over time through, you know, the crucible of, of pressure and heat. <laughs> what is life but pressure and heat, you know? <laughs> you get diamonds. You get that diamond clarity through going through that pressure. Thank you, Kelly. I think uh, Eckhart says that, right? Like uh, life gives you the experiences that are most needed for your evolution yeah, exactly. and why are you having that experience? Because that is what you need in this moment. You need to be stripped of all relationships in this moment so that you can go deeper. You can make that inward journey because if he were to, if, if planetary intelligence were to give you your friends, give you your sister, give you all the company you need, you would not make the journey to go deeper. So look at what the pointer is from planetary intelligence. That's what Kelly is saying, Nancy. Okay, so we're gonna to move to Lakshmi's question. Thank you, Nancy, for the question. Beautiful conversation. One creative thought gives rise to, let me find Lakshmi's question. Okay, uh, this is what Eileen had posted. Thank you so much, Eileen, uh, from Lakshmi. My question is when a human being suffers, it's karma from his, her past life or this life. I cannot comprehend when an animal goes through abuse and starvation, do animals have their karma too or only humans? Caesar, did you wanna uh, get started on that? This goes back to the whole, uh, I wanted to have this conversation about soul and soul contracts and April left us. So this beautifully wraps into that whole, why, why were we born, right? Go ahead. So every sentient being has a purpose. Um, they, meaning the animals, I believe evolve as well as humans do. However, I believe for the most part, they are conscious at a very, I don't wanna say below thought, but in a sense, that's kind of what I'm saying um, because animals more than anything are, um, are the most present beings I've ever encountered personally. Um, they have personally taught me presence um, 
or, or reinforced it as I have the luxury of um, partaking in wildlife rescue and stuff like that. So I'm kind of surrounded by animals um, often. And I, I also believe that they are placed in our lives um, for our growth in that way as well. Um, in terms of their suffering, I don't feel that it is related to karmic law per se on their end uh, because an animal doesn't know right and wrong they have no hatred per se there are other animals that do things a little different in the animal world like say um even when a lion or any any big cat 300 pound cat attacks its prey um they do it very compassionately um, a big cat a lion a tiger a leopard a cheetah when they attack their prey and they grab it by the throat they never break skin um, and that is because they need to lessen the suffering of the animal that they're actually their prey and they do that in a compassionate manner as to take on that same energy they don't want to whereas if you watch a hyena will go inside of another animal while it's still alive and rip their guts out um, but for the most part, the animal kingdom is very precious and very conscious of compassion. So a lion could basically, you know, rip their throats out and stuff. And yet they don't never break skin. They close the, the jawline just enough to cut the air off so that the death of their prey happens quickly and suddenly and without trauma. And they do that consciously and repetitively so as far as the animal suffering um i think when we witness an animal suffering i think that is more meant for us and relates more to our karma than theirs and it, it becomes a matter of we are in this moment watching an animal suffer is there something we can do about it or not because I mean it is through animals and then saving them that I've learned I mean and actually loving animals that I actually learned how to love myself through some difficult times in my life um so when we witness an animal suffering I think it is place or we, we know that everything happens for a reason nothing happens by coincidence and and I think that when that happens and you are witness to that um it, it is placed before your very eyes in that moment for a reason and it just may be um, it's for the betterment of yourself. It's for your growth to witness this. And, and the responsibility to me means exactly that. Um, what is your response to your ability to do something in the moment? So you have a response, which is your action, um, and the ability, what are you able to do in the moment as a response to help somebody that is what responsibility to me is so if that's placed before your very eyes and you're watching an animal suffer i don't believe it's for the from the animal's karma i think it's from your own and it is an opportunity for you to gain um growth spiritual growth in some way shape or form through that very um experience uh and i'll leave it at that Beautifully said, uh, Caesar. Phenomenal. I was exactly that same exact thought came into my mind that it's not the animal's karma. It's if we understand the nature of personal reality, we are creating this reality. So some unconscious human has created the reality where they have animals that are starving and that they are abusing. That's their reality. They co-created that reality for themselves, right? So what we can do as uh, more compassionate, more loving, when loving kindness and compassion is pouring out, we can see that event and find the antidote to it, right? Like you do animal rescue. There are so many people that are into animal rights, right? that evokes loving kindness. So we are always moving towards unconditional love. Mm. Even the starvation of the animals and abuse of animals 
what is it doing making us move towards unconditional love right but the reality was co-created by the unconsciousness somebody co-created some human some unconscious human created that reality because nothing is done without a human imagination Intent. yeah 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 and i never even considered the other side of that what you just touched on as the suffering of the animal as a result of the human's actions in the first place. Um, that didn't even cross my mind, but thank you for touching on that as well. And, and again, I mean, with that, at some point, hopefully there would be some guilt that kicks in at that point and an and opportunity for them to relinquish that. And, and again, grow. And, and like you just said, everything is always moving towards love and compassion. So yeah, that was perfect. You know? Thank you, Caesar. Because consciousness is experiencing the, whether it is the starving animal or a human being suffering from COVID-19, right? Consciousness is experiencing both pain. Somebody's having stage four cancer, somebody's having uh, whatever heart disease. There is pain. Consciousness is constantly what Eckhart chose, right? Like consciousness is coming through, going away, coming through, going away coming through, going away. So it's experiencing all these experiences, but each experience, whether it is the animal form, the bee world, Eckhart says bees are having the bee world, the tiger is having the tiger world, the uh, bird is having, pigeon is having the pigeon world, right? Their consciousness is evolving. They evolved, right? Darwin's theory said we went from the fish to the uh, amphibian to land animals, uh, they're evolving. They have the capacity to evolve. Even a rudimentary stone has the capacity to evolve. So that's the nature of, uh, and for us, and this is one thing that I have understood in the past couple of years is nothing is out of order. Like everything is interconnected. Why that unconsciousness is happening we will never know why that winter storm hit Texas, right? But I do know the amount of loving kindness and compassion that came through. There's a furniture store called Z Gallery. It opened its doors and let people sleep on the couches and everything, right? Whatever is the display furniture, they let people come sleep in there. Look at that kindness, right? Look at the compassion. People, um, my uh, company, the next day they had water at, like we could go pick up water, meals, uh, hygiene kits, like continuously that Saturday, uh, Friday was the last freeze day and Saturday, Sunday, they kept pumping water. You could go pick up water. You could go pick up hygiene kits. You could go pick up meals. They delivered, I don't know what, 200,000 meals or so. Like they started in somebody, brought all, even in the middle of a winter storm, they brought all that together. The HR department must have brought all that together and made that happen on that Saturday and Sunday because people were without water. Like the whole, like the whole uh, certain suburb was turned off. Like at the main, they turned off the water because all the pipes broke. So all the houses in that uh, neighborhood where they had no water, people didn't have water for four or five days like running water was turned off because so many pipes broke in Texas. Uh, this was a story. So look at the compassion. I mean, I, I'm like, it, it just amazes. I'm, I just sit back in awe. It's like awe-inspiring. We, and the awesome part is like the people on the panel, the people in the group, already are, have embarked on living this life of loving kindness, gratitude, compassion. The world is learn, learning through experiences, right? The rest of the world is learning through experiences. So thank you, Caesar. Travis, you seem to be ready to say something. So I want you to say something. Thank you. Do you know we are talking about Lakshmi's question that's on the mm -hmm. chat? Okay, great. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, well, um, so I think karma, like enlightenment, 
Um, uh, it's it, when enlightenment happens, it happens now in this moment. When one is free from karma, they're freed from karma now. And I, I, I'm wondering as to whether or not it's relevant to trace any karma back to its origin. It almost seems as though perhaps it could go back into time immemorial, you know, on and on and on into the past behind us. So what, um, so to me, the question isn't where did the karma begin in this life or the last life or the life before that? The, the question is, when does one become free from karma? Now. It has to be now. And, that, and it, it, it doesn't have to be now and forever, just for, just for right now, if only but for a moment. May, be, wait, may we be free from that, that wheel of karma. If only, but just for this one brief moment, might, might we uh, uh, you know, uh, keep our heads above water. Um, and so that, that's, to me, the more uh, um, relevant question is, is, is just, can I do that right now? Um, and and so and uh, to, to go into, I I I, it's it. Her compassion is evident and beautiful to me in in her love and care and concern for the you know a, a, any any living uh, sentient being being harmed in any way. I can see that that matters and that's beautiful um and good um uh you know so what comes up for me with, with this stuff is something that i i almost hesitate to go here because i don't know if it'll be well received or not but i'll give it a try is that um it, the the word reality comes up for me, because we're talking about creating this reality and creating that reality. To me, reality isn't something that is created. What's created is not reality. What's created appears to be real. It's so convincingly real because it's made out of reality. And reality is real. <laughs> it's absolutely real. It doesn't change. And so here's how we can discern and differentiate if it's different colors and changing and moving and different all the time and now it's something else and then a minute passes and now it's something else. That to me isn't worthy of the title reality. It's not anything that I can hang my hat on. It's not anything that I can utterly rely upon. Um, reality, I need reality. I need to know what I can count on. That it's, it's just as real today as any other day. That no matter where I go, it's no less real. I could be in any far corner of this vast existence. And there it would be for me all the same. No less than ever before. It doesn't change in time. To me, that's reality. And that's what I want to get to know because I think that's probably who I am. And, and so when we're caught up in karma, when we're caught up in time, when we're caught up in what we often call reality, <laughs> which is you know like in in the uh, right it, they call it maya the veil of illusion and it's it's a very rare soul who's capable of seeing through this veil of illusion to 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 that which is utterly real unchangingly real 
and so it's 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 it, 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 I know for me, I, I, I every moment is another opportunity for me to refine my degree and quality of consciousness, so that I might be better able to know reality. To 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 be that reality, um, and watch time wash away all that isn't reality. And then something new will come to be. And so, so I guess in, in relation to the suffering of the, 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 the hardship and the pain and all of the different stuff that we and animals and all life forms go through, uh, it, it, to exist on the physical plane, um, it's, it, 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 uh, it doesn't last forever. It's not real forever. It might be real enough now. The pain we go through and the hardship and the troubles we go through. But that will not be real later. <laughs> it's, it's only so real. It's only relatively real. There's, you can put it a million different ways. But that, this too shall pass, right? That, that, that when, when there's suffering, when there's pain, and in the end, it's all kind of beautiful from a, from a certain vantage point, from a certain perspective, even, e, e, even, even dark ages that humans pass through where we mistreat each other and animals and, 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 and the earth, even that has its poetry too. So, um, so for me, the emphasis is, is, uh, is, is, is how well can I keep uh, some fair to, to a portion of my attention on, on what I'm calling reality right now, um, because I feel like that's the way out of suffering. So that's my weird answer to that question. <laughs> Thanks, I know that was a little long. <laughs> so. Thank you, Travis. Hopefully, wherever you were dwelling, not hopefully, wishing, I shouldn't say hope, I should say wishing, wherever you were dwelling, what you call real, we envision a planet where there is no more starving animals. So we can be the co-creators of a world where there are no starving animals and no cruelty towards animals, right? And the, and the lion shall lay down with the lamb. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that vision. Appreciate it. Eileen, I know Kelly's going to speak for a long time, so you will speak for a short time. So you go first, and then Kelly's going to speak and wrap it up for us. Thank you. I actually wasn't going to add too much to this. I don't really have a lot of experience with this particular topic so I was listening um, but I was going to speak in between um, just because I'm exhausted <laughs> it's been a very difficult week so I didn't want to just drop off without saying anything um, so I wanted to um, get some rest that I was going to be disappearing sure and get some rest Kelly I have to email you because Zachary wants to take classes now. I know, I know, just told me tonight when he heard you talking. <laughs> so I'm gonna reach out to you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, so grateful, Eileen. I'm like deeply humbled that you showed up. I mean, it's an honor, <laughs> thank you, thank you, exactly. <laughs> it's an honor for what you've been gone through since Sunday, it's an honor. So thank you. You don't even know the half of it, but I'll text you the rest. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Get some rest. Love you. Bye. Go ahead, Kelly. Let's wrap it up. All right. Um, Kelly will be inserted. <laughs> I got a five pounder here. No. Um, karma. Karma. Gosh. Uh, humans and animals share the illusion. 
So we are sharing the learning experience together. And humans and animals do not have the same connection to creation or the eternal. We as humans often like to anthropomorphize or project our humanness onto animals because a you know it's kind of a cute and neat thing and it helps us understand animals too and you know all the cartoons out there of like cute animals doing human things it's like well it's cute right it helps us relate to animals uh caesar i i really like what you said about how uh um oh shoot i lost my train of thought dang it i got about like eight things I want to say here. I'm trying to like, <clears throat> Caesar, Travis, uh, I really appreciate what you had to say about karma and animals. Um, yes, animals are here to also, especially educate us about how to listen to creation without being in our minds, without being in our egos. Look at cats, look at dogs, look at whales, just, you know, cruising through the ocean. I mean, how do we even relate to that mentally or egoically? Like there's, there's no contest, right? So, you know, Lakshmi's comment, you have to understand that karma is all about how we use our awareness to interact with reality. Whether or not we are swinging through the extreme of emotional pendulums of desire and despair or inside, outside, inside, outside, inside, and like super, you know, fast, like, you know, we're, we're smoking crack because we're, we're so agitated and we can't be still. That's what karma is, whether or not we can relate to it mentally, emotionally, physically, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, So when an animal goes through abuse, again, it's a reflection of the illusion. It's the reflection of the need for pain to cause us to see deeper. Animals going through pain always, you know, again, hopefully will trigger whoever is causing them pain to change, to, to see beyond their need to take power from something else that they consider lesser than them because they feel powerless the whole abuse of animals is about power and humans not feeling feeling powerful and wanting to take out their own personal pain on something that they consider less than from my understanding and from what i have studied and what i have experienced is that animals are a direct connection to the elemental or the pure creation aspect of reality. I mean, look at how spontaneous cats and dogs are. You know, animals have that that utterly pure connection to creation, just, just do stuff, right? With no mental analysis, just like, dog, stick, go, poof, you know, cat, <laughs> bright red light, go, you know. You know? <laughs> so they are reflections of states that humans are trying to understand and often when humans abuse animals, it's because they do not want to. They are deliberately consciously projecting their control onto the animal so that they feel like they can control their own experience. Now, again, the connection between humans and, animal, and animals is very, very intimate. Yes, <laughs> Zen masters, yeah. Um, Animals are a reflection of our human state. They are a reflection of that pure connection to creation that we all wish we had and could be consciously in there and still be, you know, human. Animals share that playful, spontaneous, instinctive space that we all have in our hearts, that we all have as part of us, as just, you know, naturally being human. And the abuse of animals, again, is all about having power over that space, where if a person is triggered, I mean, you know, <sighs> growing up in the country, the number of dogs that I saw, you know, kicked or, you know, whatever, 
just because they were around because people were like upset and they had no emotional discipline and they needed to feel powerful. So they took their anger out on something smaller than themselves. It's about power. It's, that kind of abuse is always about power. And that is most definitely a karmic pattern. Animals are here to remind us of how things could be. And human ego has a really hard time with that. And that is why we also love animals is because they do remind us because they are so incredibly beautiful. Like if you've ever watched a herd of wild horses galloping across sand dunes or through the, you know, the surf on a beach, it's amazing. It's an absolutely beautiful moment. Or a herd of elephants deliberately walking through the underbrush. You know, um, animals have that other space. They instinctively have it. They also have personalities, which is also a reflection of the illusion that we are all dealing with. But animals have a deeper instinctive connection to that other space that we could all learn from. And I know I have you know, growing up with animals, being around horses, being around cats and dogs, deer, you know, growing up out in the country, witnessing you know, an awful lot of pure animal instinct and that space of connection to nature that really, you know, often inspired me to, you know, go out and walk in the bush or go down to the river and to draw myself out of my habits and just go and explore how I felt in nature. That was one of the huge, huge gifts I got from having animals in my life. Karma is about how we choose to interact with reality, how we choose to use our awareness. Whether or not we are letting ourselves be caught in duality, that swing of pendulum of emotional extremes, or whether or not we choose to step back into observation and to be spontaneous and be playful. You know. I love cats, but I'm allergic to cats. So I, you know, take cats in small doses, but I love, I love playing with cats and dogs because it's the spontaneity. It's just the, the, the pure joy and the utter freedom that they share with us. And if anything, that's probably one of the greatest gifts that animals can ever give to us is that reflection of that spontaneity and that freedom. Thank you, Kelly. Beautiful. So um, our powerlessness made us kick the dog. So now this person is going to go through his karmic lessons of learning not to be powerless and kicking dogs. If they don't learn it in this lifetime, when they're tying back to the beginning, when their spirit leaves their body, during their final review, they will experience life from the opposite side, Lakshmi. So they will know what it feels like to starve a dog or starve an animal, abuse an animal, right? I'm tying it back to the beginning. And the animal world uh, in this book, Nature of Personal Reality, the way Seth says is this natural guilt where when the rat knows that the cat is about to pounce on it and eat it, the consciousness that is the rat already leaves the body and leaves a warm body. I mean, they, they are so balanced, right? The rat knows that it needs to leave its body so that the cat can feed on warm flesh. Just like what uh, Caesar was saying about the tiger not breaking the, the skin, right? So that there's warm flesh that it can feed and nurture. It's so this that kind of balance that inter the Indra's net, the interconnectedness. The moment we know this interconnectedness, there is perfection, right? This cosmos, this whole multiverse, this multi-dimensionality is perfect, pure perfection. There's nothing more. God is perfection, planetary intelligences. Universal intelligence is perfection and is unconditional love. We are all moving towards it.
journeying towards it. Many blessings, everyone, and honor and a privilege to have all of you, Caesar, Travis, Kelly, April, and Louise that may have joined us uh, virtually. And uh, all the challenges disappear for everyone. And enjoy yourself. And thank you, Nancy, for joining us live and giving us a beautiful question to discuss. And have a fantastic day. Many blessings. Much love. Good night.